Morning, everyone. No. Hi there. Um, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces, but uh, for those who don't know me, um, um, my name is Dave Greenshields. I'm the, uh, the product manager uh, for Barenbrook here in the UK. Uh, and I've also got with me uh, my colleague, Stefan Charrier, um, who's um, our uh, turf grass breeder uh, based in France. Um, in a former existence, Stefan also did some um, interesting t uh, breeding with bent grass, which is the main reason he's here today. Uh, I'm going to start with a um, fairly topical picture. Um, I'm sure this site was familiar to a few of you in the room. I'm, I'm hoping that it's not familiar still now, but it might be to some. Um, this was a, you know, a fairway last um, autumn. There's clearly been a lot of turf grass death uh, here. Um, annual meadow grass has been well and truly smoked. Uh, I imagine quite a bit of red fescue has also gone. Um, but you have common bent here surviving very nicely. Um, quite a lot of the talk is kind of on how this grass species could be a, a good option um, for a range of sustainability issues um, and you know drought last summer kind of proved one small point of what I want to say today. Um, yeah, kind of future needs for golf. I don't know how many people have, have had a look at this document yet. Um, the RNA have um, released a, um, a, a well put together document called Golf Course 2030. Um, I would kind of encourage people to read it if they haven't. Uh, it's basically um, trying to provide a scenario for 11 years' time, kind of what golf will look like, how can we, how can we get to where we need to be to be sustainable, really, um, uh, sustainable for a whole number of reasons and topics. Um, it, it looks at extremes of weather, um, the need for year-round golf. I think this is a really important point. Um, there are, we do have issues with golf, with people... Um, taking up the game um, and I think that we need to be able to provide facilities that offer year-round golf uh, to grow the game. Removal of pesticides, and we stood here last year talking about Ypres Dion going and we're now in a situation where uh, propiconazole has gone as well. Reduction in water use, um, yeah we'll see how that pans out in the UK but certainly elsewhere in the world for golf that's a, a very big concern. Um, as is reduction in fertilizer use. Reduction in overall maintenance. Um, you know, if, if we are struggling in certain areas for members and, and golfers, do we need to try and um, maintain the golf, golf course in a way that requires less inputs, less money, uh, less time? And, you know, those last few, you know, I think we, we need to start asking the question is, is annual medagrass? Um, sustainable um, going forward um, or are we going to see things like this again this is from last summer it's a golf course that didn't have irrigation to the greens um, you can see what happen has happened um, bent grass is surviving well and your meadow grass is dead um, and in this picture here so yeah I'm, I'm kind of hoping that um, a few of you in the room are, um, believe this um, but I think we need to really look at getting the right grass species into golf greens and elsewhere in the golf course. Um, and the time to act is now. There's lots of space still out there to get new grasses in. So hopefully I can convince a few of you to, to do that today. Uh, this is a slide from the STRI. Um, this is um, looking at data from there. Um, someone help me program, what's it called, STRI, you know what I'm talking about, measuring um, performance characteristics of golf greens. This is the data from all of the greens they assessed in 2016. Uh, you can see the number of greens in each of the categories uh, that were measured. Um, it's really to highlight the you know, performance of the finer grasses. Um, we have firmer surfaces. We have smoother and truer surfaces than annual meadow grass. And if you bear in mind as well here that realistically, you know, this is bent dominant, this is meadow grass dominant, but in reality, you know, the bulk of these are going to be a mixture of both. And yet we're still seeing big differences between the two categories. So I really think that's, that's kind of showing that 
the more bent grass you have in the green, the better it is going to perform. So if we are um, looking at species exchange, you know, what are the options? What turf grass species can we look at? Um, I'm talking mainly about golf greens here. Um, perennial ryegrass, well, you know, I think this, there's been some great advancements in breeding, but I think for golf greens, there's still a compromise in performance with the vast majority of cultivars. Red fescue, it's a great golf green grass, as we all probably know, um, but I think for the UK, golf market where we still have an awful lot of soil push-up greens, it's difficult to get red fescue dominance. Not impossible, but it's difficult. Uh, and certainly red fescue is it for a year-round grass species in monoculture does have its limitations as well. So we're kind of left with bent grasses, really, of the major turf grass species that we use here. Bent grasses can be um, subdivided, different species. So we've got brown top or common bent the Grostus capillaris, also the Grostus tenuous. Um, creeping bent, the Grostus stolonifera, and velvet bent, the Grostus canina. And really what I want to achieve today is to prove that, um, that brown top, with or without red fescue, I think is really the best choice that we have for both performance and sustainability in the UK and Ireland. I have a very quick look at the um, turf grass seed booklet. Um, this is 2013, and this is the, all the bent grasses from the three different species. These, the data that goes into this trial is all the same trial. So the bent grasses are all put together, so the data from those three tables can be compared and contrasted with one another. And 2013, what we see is velvet bent, shoot density visual merit, very, very high in comparison with the two other species. Creeping bent and brown top have similar data. Fast forward five years to, to 2018, uh, and the situation has changed. The reason it's changed is that there's been some very big advancements in brown top bent grass breeding coming out of New Zealand. My colleague here was partly responsible for that. That's why he's here today. But we've seen... Creeping bent, same varieties drop in comparison with the top of the brown top list. And we've actually seen the velvet bents get very much closer in sort of fineness and denseness to these new varieties coming out. There's no wear on this trial, so bear that in mind. Um, I would have got some data later on that perhaps start to question some of the other grass species in terms of their winter performance underwear. Yeah. And so this is kind of where we're at now with bent grasses. This is a brown top bent. Uh, we really have taken some big steps forward in terms of fineness, density, um, visual merit. Um, and this grass is, and I'll say, the reason that my colleague Stefan's here today, and so he's going to take over and go through a little bit about grass breeding and bent tops. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I don't get my English from France, right? I'm French. Uh, Excuse me. I spent. <laughs> All right. Well, if you How were sleeping now, you're awake, right? Um, yeah, I spent 10 years in New Zealand, and that's uh, the Aratown and Charles. That's where they come from, and that's uh, I was lucky enough to be part of it. But you see, I've been back uh, seven, eight years now, and. Um, it's just being released. So just to give you a sense of how long it takes to uh, get a variety going um, and through the testing and everything. So what I'm going to try to do today is trying to present and introduce you to the breeding and uh, what we do, what's done behind the scene before you get the bag of seed and use it in your, uh, in your golf courses. So what do we do? Uh, we are searching for the best grass, but how do we do that? Huh, that's a good question, right? Um, well, if you see people walking around, um, well, usually we do ask before we go, but uh, that's downstairs. So the two of my colleagues, one from Mars Grenier in the south of France and Evrard from uh, Jérôme and Evrard from uh, Wolfes in um, Holland, we do, we go outside, we uh, go in different places and uh, pick up some plants uh, in the environment. 
this one is the golf on the golf de board in uh, Loire Valley, and we picked up some survival plants because they've obviously been there, uh, naturally selected. Um, so we go and do that, and that's I'm explaining that to you because part of Charles and or the brand top breeding program is based on that. We also use technology. Uh, of course, we cannot see as a breeder what's happening in the plants. We want to improve the plants. We want to bring disease resistance. We want to bring fineness. We want to uh, bring, you know, winter cold tolerance and so on. But it's hard for us to see that by eye, right? The plant is not talking to us, unfortunately. So we, um, we have a little bit of technology now that can tell us what, um, if we've done the job or not. It's nothing to do with GMO, right? Just, it's just tools that we can use to know what we're doing. So I'm going to show you the breeding cycle. It's going to go reasonably fast, but I can tell you it's not. Um, so we've done the work before. We've picked up some plants. Sometimes, you know, they're not worth anything, but we go then and put them in nurseries, put 20, 30, 40,000 plants. Um, from that, we select the best, the plants that we want for the characteristics we're looking for. We put them in isolations. Um, all the grass species um, uh, pollen, uh, wind pollinate, so, so we have to isolate them in uh, rye corn or things like that, plants like that. And then we harvest by hand. Everything is obviously small scale, so it's all done by hand. Then there's a, a new breeding line. We have to test it first in house to see if it's any good, because unfortunately, uh, most of the time you think you've got the best and unfortunately it comes out to be uh, average. So uh, you do have to test a lot of lines. We probably have um, 200, 300 new lines every year and out of that maybe one or two will make it to the end. So it's quite a, when you're a breeder you can't be pessimistic otherwise you just stop straight away. Uh, if there's something, if it's good, if there's a market, uh, we talk to the guys uh, and um, Yes, there is. Okay, let's go and uh, multiply the seed, and then it goes into uh, the STRI, uh, French um, testing, national testing in every, all the countries. If not, either it's absolutely rubbish and it's just dumped, or it's got some attributes that we like, but let's say it's got good disease resistance, but it lacks fineness. Well, let's keep going and do some more cycling and screening. And the next slide will just put things in perspective, right? Um, that's not days, months, right? Or weeks. That's years. Okay. So I'm lucky enough, I'm still reasonably young as a breeder, so I can still have a few things that will come up. But um, so you have the first part, which is the prospection part uh, here that you've seen the picture at the beginning. That's one, two, three years. Then you've got some breeding work. We do a little bit from something. Uh, and then you've got to multiply the seed to get enough to go into trial. Then you do the testing in-house, three years. And then if something is good, you have to multiply the seed to get enough seeds to get into uh, all the different national lists. Then you do national trials. It's another three years. And if you're lucky enough, after all that, you get on the list. And then you have to start multiplying the seed to go from... Here we've got two, three, four hundred gram. Here we get fifty, hundred kilogram, and then you have to crank up the production. So as you can see, it's a long process. So when I was telling you that I was lucky enough that, like variety, like Charles, that I was working for ten years in New Zealand and I've been here back eight years, and now it's arriving on the market. And so that shows you that it's a real timeline. We we cannot speed that up. Okay, that's. So we have to be patient as plant breeders, right? I started, I was young, and I thought, yeah, I'll go quickly. But actually, no, you can't. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, so what are we looking at? We're looking at the turf quality, soil density, leaf fineness, short mowing quality, seed yield. We have to produce the seed, right? Unless you're prepared to pay it three times, four times the price, which I'm not sure about that. Uh, but we have to have seed, high seed production for all the species we're working on. Disease, insect resistance, low input, water, fertilizer, chemicals. Obviously, that some of them are going. <laughs> that's probably going to disappear soon. Uh, germination, speed of establishment. Then there's also salt tolerance and other innovation that we're working on. 
Uh, as you can see, we've got trials. We probably set up about a hectare every year, one to two hectares every year of trials where we look at uh, the at different heights and we do evaluation scoring every month for uh, turf quality, fineness, disease, and so on. So that takes a bit of time. Um, when it looks, if we look at insect tolerance, uh, we, we're testing things, and you can see here, for instance, that some species already have naturally some good tolerance to certain, um, like nematodes, for instance. So here, brown top, compared to with uh, a, a range of uh, creeping bands, and naturally, brown top's got a very strong tolerance. That's some test we've done with FB uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and so that's already interesting. So let's work on this, and let's carry on with that. So that's a good base for us. Then we look at drought torrents. And drought torrents, uh, we, we set up, we're in the south of France, right? So some people would say, why do you set up a rain out shelter? Well, because we do get thunderstorms at times, and so we want to make sure that we can control the, the, the water. So we would leave things in the rain out shelter for about three months without any irrigation, and then we will pick up the survivors. Now, this is an extreme example here, but that's tall fescue, and the plant that you see dead are not, I haven't done anything to them. They've died by themselves because of drought. So we're really pushing things to the extreme. And that is the aim of the breeder. The breeder is not there to be nice to the plants. He's there to select the survivors and the best ones. So that's extreme conditions, but that's how we do it. And same thing with all the different species. And then we test the best variety and species and mixture in rain out shelter as well with irrigation system that we can control how much we're putting on. Do we put nothing? Do we put just a little? or we do nothing for a while, put a lot in one, and see how it recovers. But we can test all our lines like that. Low input selection. Um, we have systems like hydroponic system like this. You know, we can look at nitrogen, phosphorus, different type of, um, different type of nutrients, and uh, compare, select plants in there. Uh, of course, it's difficult to do that in the ground, so we do that hydroponically. We can also do screening for salt. Um, it's, well, being in New Zealand, I've been to Australia quite a few times, and uh, for about eight years, they had no water, no rain, drought. So salt was a problem. It's not such a big issue in Europe yet, but there's recycled water that's going to be used, starting to be used maybe on golf courses. I don't know if any of you are doing that. But recycled water is usually charged with all sorts of things, and you know, screening for salt, the salt are the same ones. So we, we do that, and, uh, but the nutrients thing is also important because we're looking for something that is able to grow and tiller and get, stay dense, maintain the color with the low input of nitrogen, really. So that's, that's how we do it. Now, the brown top, uh, a little bit about the brown top. Um, it's, it's a species that is very well adapted to the UK environment. It's also very well adapted to the New Zealand environment. But when you think about it, the environment are quite well kind of similar. Uh, so you find it everywhere. It's rhizomatous type, occasionally it's totally for its perennial grass. Uh, it's fine everywhere in the British Isle, so it's obviously well adapted. So it's not like you're trying to put a species that is just not found in the environment. So naturally, it's there. Um, it go, grows in all sorts of types of soil, sand, clay, and also in dry, acidic type. Um, Um, you find it in all sorts of different locations, you know, things, uh, also even with area with heavy metal. Um, so it's very strongly adapted to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to uh, the UK. And you find it going from 0 to 1,200. So that was just a bit of ecology about brown top. The variety trials, um, so that was selected on New Zealand golf courses, um, all golf courses that hasn't been re for a long, long time. So obviously, naturally, it's been selected under short mowing for, for long times. And it was actually selected and uh, picked up in, from memory, Central Tago. Um, then we did several years of selection, obviously, to make the variety as it is now, with um, selecting the best plant out of it for density, disease, fineness. Sometimes you get things that you think are going to be the best, and they look absolutely horrible. But we have to, put, to do some work. I mean, the breeder has to do something. Um, it's very well adapted to short, in, to short mowing and low input. Um, it's light, medium green, and very fine and dense. And I think that's it for me. Thank you.
Okay, for the remainder of the talk, I um, just want to go back a little bit and kind of focus in on this question, why brown top? Um, I'm going to present a, a few slides on the following subjects. So high performance, we all want golf greens that perform well. Year-round performance, competitive against annual metagrass, disease tolerant, uh, low water requirements, low nitrogen requirements, low maintenance requirements. Um, yeah, just another picture from last year's drought. Um, you know, and this really is, this is, this is, this is red fescue <coughs> has died. Got a little bit of sheep, so hard fescue up here. The majority of the surviving um, is common bent. So going back um, a few years, um, Barenbrug did a, a very large trial with STRI uh, called the Golf Green Differential Input Trial. Um, and I just want to show you some results that actually weren't published uh, at the time um, to kind of prove a couple of points. Um, this was a four-year trial. Um, we had two different maintenance regimes in the trial. So we, we set up a golf green with lots of different grass mixtures and we maintained the two sides in two different ways. So we have standard maintenance, four mil mowing height in the summer, 120 kilos of N for the year uh, with regular verti cutting. And we had low input, a higher height of cut, less nitrogen and less aggressive maintenance. Now I appreciate this realistically is not for everyone, um, but I just want to touch on a few things. The key point here is that unlike uh, the BSPB guide, uh, we had a wear machine running the whole time on this trial for four years, uh, the STRI wear machine. Uh, so it really did mimic uh, the effect of, of golfers um, for, the, for the time period. So what grasses did we look at? Well, we looked at 100% brown top, 100% um, uh, red fescue, a mixture of slender and chewings, a traditional 80-20 fescue bent, uh, with high quality with brown top, a lesser quality fescue bent with highland. And we looked at cretin bent, velvet bent, annual metagrass, and a few others that I'm, I'm not going to talk about today. How do we assess them? Uh, we looked at botanical composition, so how these mixtures changed over time in terms of what grasses were in the plots. Uh, visual merit on a monthly basis. We looked at Clegghammer readings, uh, disease data, and there were other things um, as well. Um, and I would kind of, you know, I, I, th th this trial is important, and I, I would sort of um, state this, that the, the length of the trial and the fact that we had wear kind of does separate this work from, from a lot of other studies that have been done. Um, that's a picture of the area whilst it was growing in. So the botanical composition, just to give you an insight into some of the trial work, um, it's, it's a very labor-intensive process, but somebody um, takes a little grid out like this um, and sees this effectively. Now what we have here is a series of pins, but we actually have two pins here, one on top of the other. So the person would move their head along the grid to line up these two pins, and whatever they see right at the base of the pin, they would score. So they might see a bent grass plant, they might see a poa plant, they might see bare ground. And they do it 100 times in every meter squared plot. Um, I'm glad it wasn't me doing it, um, although a large chunk of my budget disappeared very quickly. Um, so just touching on the, the low maintenance, um, low nitrogen requirements of brown top bent, remember we did these two different sides of the trial. So this is the, this is the average over the four years uh, in the relaxed input. And what we have here is we have brown top outperforming creeping bents and velvet bent. Um, and these are the actual data. The annual metagrass didn't make it onto this graph. Um, it was not very good at all. Um, so just, yeah, it's a, look, it's, 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 one, it's one location, but it is four years. It is with where. And uh, I kind of hope that it proves that brown top is probably better than the other bent grasses under low maintenance, if that's the way you want to go. High performance. So this is under the standard input regime. This is the four mil mowing height with verti cutting with um, reasonable amounts of nitrogen. And we have again brown top. Velvet was pretty good for four, four years. Annual metagrass, Cretan bent, less so. The best plots, 
with a good old traditional 80-20 red fescue brown top bend. By the end of the trial, it was probably 70% bent, I think, from memory. I think it does appear in a later slide. Um, but it did have some fescue in there. Uh, and a big change between this and the same mix, but with Highland bent in it. So again, really, uh, I hope, showing the benefits of brown top um, as, a, as a species. Uh, that's a picture of the wear machine, just so people understand exactly what is, what's happening. Year-round performance. Uh, this graph looks messy and complicated. It, it, it's not. We have a standardized graph here. So the line zero is the average of the whole trial. So if you're above the line, you're better than average. If you're below the line, you're worse. Um, and just want to highlight one thing here, really. We have brown top and red. We have a funny mix, actually, that was, this is a combination of brown top and creeping bent. And then we have the same creeping bents by themselves. And this is the, what I wanted to point out, this big dip in performance um, uh, during winter. This is actually an establishment phase, so the wear probably kicked in. I think it was around about here we started the wear. And we see a big drop off in creeping bent performance. It does go dormant in winter. Yep, south of England, just about get away with it, maybe, but brown top will outperform creeping bend in the winter months. Competitive against POA. This is the botanical composition graphs. So this is at the end of the trial, so after four years, standard maintenance, brown top, 10% POA, and this mix of brown top with creeping, I think it's 8% POA. Creeping bent by itself, a lot more, more than double. Again, this is winter, it's dormancy, it's wear, and POA comes in, in the gaps. So brown top, very effective at keeping annual meadow grass out. Disease tolerance, um, this is mycodopium fuzz. Um, we got some nice outbreaks during the trial. Um, three times, some really nice data, uh, 2006 and into seven. Brown top, excellent. Creeping bent, very good. Creeping bent, very good. The 80-20, very good. Velvet bent, very weak in this trial. Annual metagrass, as we might expect, very weak in this trial against mycodokium. Uh, low maintenance, this is, the, this is the clay hammer stuff. This is looking at surface softness and also um, thatch levels. Um, again, a standardized graph. So below the line is softer, above the line is firmer. So red fescue, nice and firm. Brown top, around about average. It does produce thatch, um, but it's around about average in the trial. Velvet is the one to highlight in this. Extremely soft. Creeping bents, actually about similar to brown top. Um, thatch levels, yeah. Velvet, significantly more thatch depth almost at the end of the trial as this data was taken. So yeah, well, you can't get hold of any velvet bent as it is now, but um, just a, a word of caution against that species. <coughs> so conclusions at the end of the four-year trial. Um, I have some copies of a booklet we produced. Um, we concluded that a blend of capillaris brown top and red fescue um, is the best option for year-round golf, golf greens in the UK. Um, brown top was superior to creeping bent, particularly in the winter months. 100% red fescue was not ideal for winter play requirements. It did suffer in the winter. Um, velvet bent as a thatch issue and the surface softness is a major drawback of the species. Annual meadowgrass, highland bent were very poor. Okay, so going away from that trial and going to look a bit more closely at the BSPB turfgrass seed trials, the things that produce the booklet every year. I um, just want to give you a bit of insight into this, how it's done, and then talk a little bit about the Bengrass trial again. Uh, so BSPB stands for the British Society of Plant Breeders. It is wrong to say this is the STRI booklet. It is not the STRI booklet. It's the BSPB booklet. Uh, so British Society of Plant Breeders are a trade association based in Cambridgeshire and they represent plant breeding and seed suppliers in the UK for all plant species. So for this, we have a, an amenity crop group committee um, that has representatives from 
um, all the major breeders and seed, and seed suppliers uh, in the country. So I sit on that committee um, and people from other seed companies do as well. So we coordinate the trials, we fund the trials, um, and we make sure they are independent and as close as we can ach realistically achieve to the requirements of, of you guys. Um, so we, we choose to work with STRI uh, to produce that annual publication and all of the data is done by STRI. This differs from a lot of European lists. Um, it's more common in Europe to have multiple locations actually with all the different grass breeders and they you know, agree to not be silly and come together and produce a, a similar kind of list. So just looking at the close mown trials, the golf green trials, uh, we assess a range of grasses, bent grasses, all together, chewings, slender, perennial ryegrass, hard sheeps and strong creeping red fescues. Um, four mil in the summer, rising depending on the species to maybe a maximum of seven during the winter. They are sown every other year. They are sown in the even years. So there was a trial sown in last year in 2018. And they generally sow them around about end of May, start of June. To get on the list, you need to have two complete trials. And each trial lasts two years. Okay, so it's roughly four years of trialing. It's actually a little bit more, but it's about four years of trialing. Um, the ranking is based on two characteristics, shoot density and visual merit. Uh, but we do collect other data, some of which appears in the booklet, some of which you don't see. Um, but I am able to share bits today that doesn't say which varieties are which. Um, and this is an example of the, of the bent grass trial. Um, it's, I recommend anyone to go and see this. Um, it, it is worth seeing. Uh, you do appreciate the vast differences between varieties in a, in a whole range of species and uses. So I just want to look a bit closely at the last bent grass trial that's finished, 2014. Uh, the 2016 is just about to finish now, but we don't have data on it. So this was the last one uh, to finish. Um, and I can't show you individual varieties, but I can show you um, some averages. So this is the best brown top in the trial, the best creeping bent, and the best velvet bent. And I've done a bit of a traffic light system here. So green is, the, is number one, orange is number two, and red is number three. So we have brown top. Again, this new trial material has the best shoot density, the best visual merit, the best finest leaf, and higher tolerance to fuzz than the other species. Creeping bent, um, better on fuzz. Velvet bent, again, lets it down. And I've also included the averages you know, we have a lot more brown tops in this trial, some of which is quite old material, which does drag the average down. Um, but, you know, you get the picture again. Fusarium tolerance, and we have some quite close data here in the, in the creeping bents. Just to kind of highlight, you know, these are not subtle differences in a whole range of things. This, this can be the difference between a pretty bad outbreak and for furs and not. So this is a picture from the trial. Interestingly, you know, you would, they, they would still have to score this. They'd score the visual merit and the shoot density of the areas not affected with disease. Now, anyone familiar with this publication will not see this data. Be the reason being is that we don't, every time we run a trial, get a sufficient enough outbreak to produce meaningful data. We did in this 2014 trial, but we didn't likely in the 2016. So that's why it's not in the booklet. Okay? I hope that makes sense. You see a red thread score in the booklet because we pretty much always see red thread at some time to score everything accurately. Um, same, same trial, same data. This is just a, this is performance and microdokium tolerance. So we would like to see things up in this top corner with a good um, a good combination of both. And the blue dots are brown top, the yellows are creepers, and the reds are velvet. Um, and again, you know, there are big differences at certain times. Um, this is another, this is basically as the trial progressed, um, showing the performance of 
um, brown top versus uh, creeping. And again, the potential for a dip in winter to spring with creeping Ben is the reason this slides up. You get far more consistent year-round performance with brown top. This is the average of all of the varieties in the trial. I'll touch on anthracnose. Um, it is increasingly a problem. Um, not a huge amount of research has been done on, in the UK, um, but you know I think it's well um, well known. Annual meadow grass is the most susceptible turf grass species, but they do get quite a lot of outbreaks on creeping bent in the states, and we do also see it. I've actually seen it this this autumn on ryegrass um, and velvet. Again, brown top is very good, generally speaking, against anthracnose. Um, as we quite often see on golf greens. I'm going to finish with a, with a quote, a uh, fairly familiar one, I think, that everything comes full circle, uh, William Shakespeare. Well, golf began life really in properly, proper golf began life in Scotland on, on fescue bent links, um, actually around about the time of Shakespeare. You know, landscapes that look a bit like this. Um, and yeah, look, I accept on soil push-ups that fescue is maybe a step too far for many, uh, but I do think that brown top bent grass dominant greens are within the reach of most. Um, golf's traditions lie in these grasses, uh, and I believe its future sustainability and success in the UK depends on them. Um, so yeah, brown top bent grass, traditional grass species for the future of golf. Um, I do have some colleagues that I think have, have got some information if people are wanting to take things away. So we have some brand new turf grass seed booklets that won't cost you four pounds. Um, we have the, the summary of the, the Golf Greens trial and some overseeding guides for people who are interested in that. Uh, thank you very much for turning out. Do appreciate it. We got any time for questions? Two minutes or any questions? Yeah. Are you finding a better way of introducing the seed with this seed or different seeders or time of year even? Um, so the gentleman's asking about method of application. Um, I, this booklet, I hope, kind of is, is quite long winded summarizing. I, I spoke here last year about the exact question, so I won't dwell on it. Um, yeah, I think um, there are. A large range of criteria um, and I think you need to assess um, them all respective to, to your location what your members are wanting etc etc um, so yeah please pick one of them up because I hope it does answer the question reasonably well Vaughan? You, you said the, that working out what the grass was was an incredibly expensive process did you put any money into the research that was started to try to work out from cutting and collecting the DNA process of the grasses. Did you put any money into that and what's happened to that research program? Uh, yeah, sorry, it's a question about um, DNA analysis of clippings to identify um, grass composition. Um, it was an ongoing project that was with STRI. Um, we didn't fund that project, so it was, as far as I'm aware, it was funded purely by STRI and they were trying to integrate it into their program. Um, I think the major difficulty they came across was that um, you could identify genetically the differences okay, um, but at any given time, your clippings didn't necessarily represent the species composition. So if, if you imagine in springtime, you might mow a golf green and pick up a lot of bent grass and not be touching any poa, and that might give you a reading that was a long way off what you were actually looking at. So as far as I'm aware, aware the project is dead. It's not going to happen, unfortunately. There are guys that, I know a couple of guys that will charge a reasonable amount of money to, to do that job. A lot cheaper than STRI, but anyway, um, it's doable. With digital image technology, taking a photo of turf, and looking at that, I think that is not far off producing a reasonable result. That is something that we're working on. Thank you. Yeah. Paint intensive. Yeah. 
Probably a question for you, Stefan. Um, it's got protection for about 20 years. They don't get retested every year, so you're recalled in the, with, with the BSPB booklet, you're recalled every eight years for a retest. Um, there are a series of checks, uh, it's called um, DUS, which stands for Distinct, Uniform and Stable, that effectively helps to protect yeah. someone like Stefan going and stealing something else. Um, so yeah, 20 years and then it's open market, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the, as long as the variety is on the market and it's with DUS, then in Europe anyway, it's, it's kind of protected. But So when, I, what I, when you want to list the variety, you actually have to go through the agronomy trial, but you also have to get DUS. And DUS means that you're comparing it with all the variety that are on the market at the moment, or not, even the old ones. So your variety has to be distinct from all those. Uh, just an example, in ryegrass, it's about 1,500 varieties. So you have to be distinct against all of those. That takes three years. It's done at the same time as the agronomy trial. Today, we actually have more troubles to get the DUS because there's so many varieties uh, than getting on top of the table for the agronomy side. So it's a very, you have to get both to be able to have the variety on the market. So your question is, well, the question is that can you take your old cultivar and improve it? Well, um, yes, you can. Some breeder do that. Um, I don't. Uh, you just take a variety from a competition and do a quick cycle. The only thing is you don't know if you're going to get the DUS. That's a way to protect that original one. But you can do that often. But often, you know, that variety may have a weakness for some reason. Um, and often what happens is the new variety are uh, way better than the old ones anyway, so you've, you're already way ahead of that. What, what it, sorry, what, what, what is done with the breeding is that we take current varieties are constantly used to cross yeah. to new yeah, material. Yeah, I understood that. Yeah. I was wondering whether it was possible, but maybe because if you were to follow the size in a year, if that cultivar was established or came out in the market, it was like 1991, everybody would see that. You can, uh, the, 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 the date of a cultivar release is available on the common catalogue, so you can access that, in that information. The European common catalogue will contain that information. It is, it is online. Yeah. That's no, no, no agronomy data, that's the, that's the status of the variety from a, um, a legal perspective. Thank you.